making a business case, accelerating financial deepening. And uh, for this session, may I please call upon stage Dr. Dipali Pant Joshi, former Executive Director, Reserve Bank of India. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joshi has four decades of experience in public life, of which uh, 36 years were spent at the Reserve Bank of India, where she was a career central banker. Ladies and gentlemen, ma'am is uh, joining us uh, through Zoom uh, from Ahmedabad. Uh, can we have uh, the Zoom connection? Ladies and gentlemen, she is a prophetic uh, writer with more than six books to her credit. At the same time, I request uh, Mr. Sriram Iyer, Chief Executive Officer, HDFC Pension Management Company Limited, to kindly join us on the stage. So we welcome you, Mr. Sriram Iyer. He carries, ladies and gentlemen, close to three decades of experience in banking and financial services industries, having played leadership roles in areas spanning banking and capital markets. He and was recently recognized as one of the top 20 pension fund executive in Asia by the Asian Investor Magazine. Sir, we welcome you. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have Dr. Vinay Singh, head SRO and uh, com compliance, MFIN with us. Sir, we welcome you. Dr. Singh, ladies and gentlemen, is a management professional with nearly two decades of experience in financial services across multinational organization. And he has a multi-business experience in consumer lending, retail banking, and insurance. Dr. Vinay Singh, we welcome you to this session. We also have Mr. Amit Jain, Chief Operating Officer, Aditya Birla Health Insurance Company Limited. We request uh, Mr. Amit Jain ji to kindly join us on the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Amitji is overseeing the operation, finance, health management, and business intelligence, and analytic functions as well. At the same time, we have uh, Samir Kochar, Sir Chairman Scotch, to moderate uh, this uh, session. And we have Dr. Dipali Pant Joshi, former Executive Director, Reserve Bank of India, has joined us uh, through Zoom, direct from Ahmedabad. Ma'am, we welcome you to this session. Well, welcome to the final session of the day, which is making a business case for financial deepening. Now, financial deepening essentially is a set of financial ratios that look at various parameters uh, in relation to the GDP. So the last time it was calculated by the World Bank for India was 2011. It has not been done since. Uh, only recently, two months back, as a part of my paper, I have calculated these ratios again, and we find that there has been a significant uh, improvement in financial debt uh, in India. But still, there is a lot of headroom, a lot more needs to be covered. Now, financial deepening and financial inclusion in India needs to go hand in hand because financial depth also requires financial spread, you know, it has to be horizontally there. There have to be more people in the net before you do multiple things with them. There are a lot of challenges in both inclusion and deepening. Some of them are common. The first and the foremost thing is the cost of financial deepening. So if you know, you say that uh, the insurance penetration in India is low or pension penetration in India is low, there is also an element of literacy and capacity building that is involved. People do not know, uh, you know, what it, why should they get insured? Why do they need health insurance? Why do they need uh, pensions? And to get each person who's not, uh, you know, asking for insurance, but needs insurance, to get that person in the insurance net or the pension net or even in the market net is a huge cost. Nevertheless, that cost has to be born if India has to become a developed country by 2047. So what are the ways and methods to cover this cost? Uh, like the earlier banking sector approach, there was a priority sector target, there's an agricultural target. So there is a target chasing approach, uh, which means the minute you meet your target, then you're happy. Because, but after your target, what is left uncovered is also still uh, enormous. The second part is lack of relevant products. The bottom of the pyramid or uh, the last mile market needs products that are very different than uh, 
the regular market does. I mean, for example, I was looking for a you know, comprehensive product for my domestic help, which would give them life, which would give them health, which would give them pensions, all rolled into uh, one. And there is no such product that is available. Individually, they are very expensive. And more so, if you buy them as single policies, not group insurance, and then you'll certainly find that for domestic workers, probably group insurance is not uh, applicable, probably even the group pension is not uh, applicable. So why are there such huge uh, gaps on that? Uh, now, if you look at bankers are best being bankers, insurance companies are best being insurance companies, pension companies are best being pension companies, but the job of outreach and channel development capacity building needs intermediaries such as NBFCs and MFIs. So what is in a sense happening is that that cost of capacity building and outreach is being passed on to NBFCs and MFIs. But is there a good enough business case for that? Is there a good enough margin for that? How sensitive are we to that? So these are some of the uh, things that we will look at. Also, unlike banking, some of these markets are fairly monopolistic, so suddenly you'll find that there is one life insurance behemoth, and you know everybody else is far behind, or there is one stock exchange which is like 90% of the market, and the other would be 10%. Now, for a regulated market to develop and develop well, I think some of these competitive anomalies have to be uh, taken care of. Uh, one example of a new regulation like this is in the NPCI in payments where, you know, NPCI as a uh, sectoral regulated kind of mandated that no single payment company can have a more than uh, X percent market share, I think more than 30 percent market share. We don't have that in markets, we don't have that in insurance, we don't have that in uh, pensions. So is it desirable, is it required? I don't know, I would leave that to the panel. So let me start with Dr. Dipali Pan Joshi, who's joining us all the way from Allahabad. She's also a distinguished fellow and friend, philosopher, and guide for me at uh, Scotch Group. Dipali ji, your thoughts on the subject? You are on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourself. First of all, congratulations, Granddad, and thank, thank you, you very much for your generous remarks, as always. Well, yes, indeed, I agree with you that a well-functioning financial system helps in the processes of financial deepening. And as you said, broadening requires more players, more institutions, and less of oligopolistic dominance, which is never good. Financial deepening, again, as you explained, refers to the increase of financial assets as a percentage of the GDP. Now, I just looked at a report by Jeffries, which said that Indian households still prefer, what do they prefer? they prefer to hold their assets as physical assets. And what are these, and I'm guilty of that too. So what are these physical assets? These physical assets are real estate, which, is, which accounts for about 51%, gold 15%, that is 66% of physical assets. 14% in bank deposits, 6% only in insurance and pension funds. And that too, I suspect, because you get a tax bill if you have these kind of uh, pension funds, etc. And 5% exposure to equities, and there's only 3% in cash. So now financial debt being very important, this is one thing which needs to be addressed with a lot of confidence and capacity building. Financial debt is an important system of financial sector development. It will measure the size of the financial intermediary sector. What does debt equal? It equals the liquid liabilities of the financial system, which as you know, and as we've often discussed, are currency plus demand, plus interest-bearing liabilities of banks and NBFCs divided by the GDP. While financial broadening, which you referred to, refers to building an increasing number and variety of participants and instruments, which I do not see happening, and which as we both discussed, Credit penetration being the fulcrum of financial deepening is very, very necessary. So now let me come to a broader issue. What are the key elements I perceive of a well-functioning financial system? 
First, of course, a strong legal and regulatory environment in which there is an enforcement of contract. Two, stable money. What do I mean by stable money? You see, just as finance is based on contract, so therefore you need strong legal and regulatory environments that produce and strictly enforce. Similarly, laws alone cannot protect the rights and rights of investors. You need strong legal systems, but you need the investors to also be aware of what their rights are. And that again brings us to financial inclusion and capacity building. I spoke of stable money. That is, you know, we all know money is a medium of exchange, a store of value, a reserve, which is just a reserve of future purchasing power, a store of value a standard of value as a unit of account for all the goods and services we might wish to trade with. So if there are large fluctuations and depreciations in the unit of money, they may lead to financial crisis, or if there are yo-yoing in, in the value of your currency against, let's say, the dollar, this can also impede the overall growth of the economy and therefore this becomes a major concern in the processes of financial deepening and broadening. You also need sound public fund includes setting and controlling public expenditure, prioritizing and raising revenue adequate to fund your public expenditure efficiently. And historically, these financing needs of the government actually led to the creation of the organization I worked most of my life for. That is the Reserve Bank, the Central Bank, because that supervises and regulates the trust. To the government, it's your lender of last resort. And it has to look and take a front line in the processes of financial inclusion. Now, recently, just two days ago, maybe just a day ago, on the 6th, the RBI has placed caps and it has raised the risk weights on what it perceives as highly volatile retail exposure. And believe me, retail book, as I see, I see, I found out, can really burn deep. I shouldn't have taken the name of the particular bank, so I'll withdraw that. But the point being that this is the caution which leads the central banks to go ahead and try to put in guardrails, because ultimately the consumer has to be protected, the economy has to be safeguarded, Financial inclusion and broadening and deepening have to be safeguarded so that we don't throw baby bath water and all out. So now this is the role of the central bank. But the most crucial role is the monetary policy, which influences the pace of economic growth. You all know the sense of relief which, which floods the corporate sector when rates are not raised. Yes, that is very necessary. But then there is a sense of equal anxiety which floods economists like Samir and me when we find that inflation is perhaps going to breach its bounds. So treading the fine line between growth and control is another task of the central bank. Anyway, let me now come to a good financial system which will require a variety of you know, financial market infrastructure. Also a variety of banks with the ability to withstand adverse shocks without failing, and we've been very lucky. Uh, we've been very lucky in India in this respect, touch wood, our banks are not failing. They remain the four financial intermediaries in the country, perform diverse, diverse functions, operate clearing and payment systems par excellence. That's your, uh, your uh, digital market. That is what underpins your digital systems with the India stack. And, uh, the monetary policy transmission also operates through banks, which is why you find a lot of anguished hand wringing when it does, it does not happen automatically. Now, the most important thing in today's day and age is guess what? It's information. So if sound financial system can develop, financial deepening and broadening can only happen when proper disclosure practices and networking of information systems are adopted. Securities markets which facilitate the issue and trading of securities, both equity and debt. Efficient securities markets promote economic growth because they mobilize and deploy funds into productive uses, lowering the cost of capital for firms, enhancing liquidity, attracting foreign investment. 
So in efficient securities, market strengthens market, also strengthens market discipline by exerting corporate control through the threat of hostile takeover of underperforming firms. So this is our environment in which we are at the moment. So what do we need? Because, uh, because Shami Bhai and I often wonder what is the one thing we need to do to affect the structural transformation to raise the level of financial deepening, broadening, capital formation, savings. Why, when we have so many of these yojanas, like we have the Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana, we have the Swanidhi Yojana, we have a social stock exchange, we are still attempting formalization of credit and labor markets to mainstream the marginalized, to, to step up financial inclusion. But, but why is it not happening? What is it that there is missing? So I'm, I'm going to ask the experts on this panel to come back to it. As far as I see it, there has to be a modified assessment of credit worthiness. And I will stop by talking about increased financial literacy, capacity building, and awareness. Because credit penetration in the rural areas is still underdeveloped and fragmented simply because there is a low awareness and I would even go for so far as to say there is a mistrust of formal financial instruments, not institutions, but the instruments. So 27% of Indian adults and of those only 24% of women and even women like me minimum levels of financial literacy. So the study also revealed that financial decision makers who are educated, younger, and have access to smartphones possess higher levels of financial literacy. This effectively leaves the poor, the uneducated, completely at the mercy of loan sharks. So the lack of access to banks or microfinance forces underserved to turn to cycles of debt. So in such a scenario, we must, if there uh, is... Thank you, uh, Dipali ji. We are having also an audio issue with you. So let me move on to the... Financial education. Uh, yeah. The panel. That's right. uh, yeah, that was all from me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you very much. So let me start with uh, Mr. Thank Shiram Ayer of HDFC Pension Management. So Mr. Ayer, this... You know, we had this wonderful new pension scheme. And as with the overzealous regulators can get at times, so there was a cap at the profit that you can make. A very recently, such a misadventure was suggested by SEBI as well, vis-a-vis -vis AMC. Fortunately, it was still born. So that was one scenario which was kind of stunting the growth of uh, uh, pensions rather than to have, you know, free market economy at play. The regulator was determining how much money a player should make or could make. Uh, and on the other hand, you still find that uh, we have our head in the 20th uh, century, state after state is clamoring for the old pension scheme. They don't really want a market-based uh, mechanism. So within all of this, how the private sector pension industry is doing and performing and what are the things that can be done to make it better and more vibrant? Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So I just want to you know, pick on a couple of things that Dipali ji mentioned about the savings wallet of an Indian. And if you look at the savings wallet of an Indian, as she pointed out, uh, the data from Jeffrey's report, 66% of Indians still save in the form of real assets. And real assets, both gold and real estate, inspire a lot of trust in people for various reasons. And I don't want to go down, the, go down that path. But if you look at either of these assets, there will be certain points in time over long periods of time when it could have delivered super normal returns. But if you look at actual returns from these products over extended periods of time, this actually doesn't beat inflation. In fact, real estate in our estimate actually delivers less than 3 to 4% per annum return, even if you include, you know, capital gains, long-term capital gain, as well as the, you know, rental yield and so on and so forth. Rental yields, as we all know, are abysmally low in India. So I think fundamentally, I think there is a you know, there is a significant skew amongst Indians and love for this physical real estate, something that you can touch and feel. Now, I'll, I'll now move to the 
you know, to the, to the point, and, and, you know, to extend that same, you know, that same, same argument, if you look at ownership of mutual funds, despite the fact that there is so much of noise around mutual funds, sahi hai, the reality is that there are less than three crore unique mutual fund investors in the country. Uh, penetration of mutual funds as a percentage of GDP is less than 15%. A country like Malaysia is at 35%, right? I mean, it's a developing country like India, slightly more developed maybe in terms of GDP, but still significantly ahead of us. Same is the case with life insurance, same is the case with various other things. On the other hand, you have 11 crore crypto investors in India, right? You've got 18 crore people who play Dream 11, right? So you've got this, you know, dichotomy where formal financial products which you should be owning are underpenetrated severely and on the other hand you have products such as these which are either uh, speculative in nature or long term doesn't really add to your, you know, it really doesn't generate returns, these are popular. Now, this is the dichotomy that is there, and while I think significant progress has been made, and, and, now, and I'd like to sort of address the question that you asked, Amirji, which was around NPS. And I think this challenge around artificially capping the fees that a pension fund manager could, be, could make, I think has its genesis in the belief that anything that is cheap will sell. And NPS, and the way NPS has grown over the last 20 years, 19 years of existence now, is a commentary on the fact that something that is cheap will not necessarily sell, it has to be sold, right? While there, are argue, there is an argument that pension funds should be bought and not sold, but the reality is that there has to be a compelling case for a company to invest in this business because it requires significant amount of intellectual capital uh, and of course infrastructure as well. And but I, I must tell you that there is, there is uh, active engagement with the regulator, there's active engagement with the government, respect, you know, relevant government bodies, to relook at this, and of course, you know, one doesn't know how soon it will happen, but I think the, the, uh, you know, the authorities are seized of the fact that this is indeed one of the core issues with respect to development of the pension sector. By the way, pension sector in India has got around 15% penetration of GDP, compared to, you know, developed countries are at upwards of 150%, we are still abysmally low. After 10 years of existence of NPS, there are less than 50 lakh non-government employees which are there. So I think there is a long road that we need to traverse. We've just about made a beginning. We've been in business for the last 10 years now uh, as a GFC pension. Uh, we are fortunate to have a large, uh, you know, client base of 17 lakh customers, 61,000 crores of assets, but it still does not, you know, make too much of commercial sense, right? And for my, my ability to invest in infrastructure, my ability to invest in, let's say, an outreach program, as you pointed out, uh, is significantly compromised on account of the fact that the margins are abysmally low. Uh, but I think uh, the, the views are changing, the thought process in this is changing, there is, a, there is an understanding that there are two, three things that need to be done, right? Access, usage, quality, I think in terms of quality, we've got a fantastic product. The national pension scheme or the national pension system is in my estimation, and having worked for 30 years, I can say this with a great deal of confidence that this is by far one of the most brilliantly designed products that the country has seen. Not just in India, I think this is the cheapest product globally. But cheap does not necessarily make it sell, it has to be made more palatable for manufacturers. I think so, we've started on this journey. Uh, you know, we are fortunate to have made, you know, signif built significant say a scale. And uh, the beauty of the capital markets is that the compounding engine works beautifully once you become large, right? So you add 10,000, 20,000 crores of assets every, every few months, and, uh, and that helps us to, you know, gives us more elbow room to invest in this business. So we've been on this journey now. I think we've got to a stage where we are at an inflection point. There is still a, a large concentration of assets with the government pension fund managers because the government employee money goes there directly, automatically, and that is also being changed or that is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a thought to sort of allow the private sector pension fund managers to also manage government employee money. So a number of things are happening, but I think we are still at a very, very early stage and we've got a long, long way to go. Okay, thank you very much. So you've kind of uh, reconfirmed my belief that there isn't enough of a business case and that needs to be addressed first before uh, we can look at any meaningful penetration. We've been uh, having some very interesting ideas uh, since the morning. And uh, one of the ideas that I have mooted is why don't we have a universal financial services obligation fund? Because the government in India, rightly so, always looks at the last mile, uh, man at the last, uh, at, at the end of the line first, right? And every policy is tailored to cater to the poorest of poor. 
So what happens is not just the poorest of the poor, the rest of them also get bereft of the benefit just because you know you've kept that prism. And you know the poorest of poor is a is is a case of 70 years of governance failure, cumulative, and the price of which is this comparative welfareism which we are paying. You know, if your daughter get married, you get a lakh, you get one tola gold, you get free gas, you get free electricity, you get free this and that. Now, at a f fraction of that, there could be subventions possible under a universal financial services obligation fund where people who are going to the last mile are reimbursed. No questions asked. So you're saying that if you're doing micro insurance or micro pensions, here is like 7% of the amount or whatever amount you come to. Uh, for very long, uh, NBFCs had the same uh, problem. You know, it started with the Andhra Pradesh NBFC crisis, and then they kind of, the whole system came down on them as a ton of bricks, and then the interest rates were capped. And what we found several years thereafter, that they stopped expanding geographically. I mean, they were just giving credit to the lower hanging fruit. People who needed the money were not getting it. And only recently that cap was removed and suddenly you find that NBFCs barely started to walk. Again, there are noises being made that they are being uh, very expensive, they're charging 24%. And I actually wonder how, how do they manage to lend even in 24%. So, you know, what is that cost equation? Where that money is going to come from? And what is the cost of this governance failure and who's going to foot it. Let me bring in Vinay Singh, who's from MFIN on this. Hello to all of you, and thank you for this opportunity, uh, Mr. Kocha. Uh, so specifically, I, I work with an organization called Microfinance Industries Network, and uh, we work very closely with banks, NBFCs, NBSC, MFIs, mainly looking at micro uh, loans. Uh, so, uh, specifically to your point on interest rates or the cost at which uh, the lending is done, if I were to split it uh, into two or three major components, one of course is the cost of funds. Uh, now NBFCs, most of them who are into microcredit do not have savings accounts for their borrowers, so they don't take money from the borrowers. They either go to banks. Uh, for taking loans which are further than lent to, uh, to in terms of smaller loans, or they go to the market, raise NCDs, etc. Larger ones are able to get good rates, right? So, so larger ones could get rates in the range of 9.6%, 10%, which is good from a relative perspective. Um, uh, 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 an individual who is into corporate banking might feel these rates are high, but that's the kind of rates which are available. But as you go down the ladder, the smaller MFIs or the smaller NBFCs uh, get rates at a higher, uh, uh, get uh, loans at a higher rate, let's say 12% odd. So clearly half of the 24% you've quoted or nearly half is the cost of funds over which an NBFC typically has no control. Then comes the cost of operations. Uh, now, of course, a lot of you would be reading in the newspapers about uh, technology, digital happening, and cost coming down and all that. Uh, but one thing which uh, we must understand is that we have to keep the consumer at the center of the plate, right? So the guys who are taking a typical loan is about 40,000, 45, 50,000 rupees. An individual taking a 50,000 rupee loan, uh, you cannot imagine him or her to be very, very savvy when it comes to uh, operating uh, online, etc. So you need to have a field force for them. You need to have people who meet them regularly, give them loans, collect loans. If there are any complaints, they handle them, etc. So that adds another six, seven percent to the cost. Uh, the flip side is it generates a lot of employment. So for example, microfinance sector uh, employs more than a couple of lakhs, 2.2 lakhs odd people as a field force. Uh, right, so that could be as a, as a, as a, on, on the other hand, that is the uh, thing. So you add the uh, you add the cost of funds, you add the cost of uh, uh, distribution or operations, then you cause you add a margin of maybe a percent, one and a half percent. And good thing is that NPAs are low, <coughs> right? So contrary to uh, contrary to uh, popular impression, if you ask anybody who doesn't know 
how the micro credit market operates, they'll typically assume that just because the borrowers are low income, the NPAs would be high. But that's not the case. Because of the model, and that's the innovation bit, maybe we'll talk about it later if we have time, the way the microfinance model has evolved is very innovative. You really have to spend half an hour to understand how this whole thing works. And uh, so the NPAs are low. So you add all this and you land at about 22, 23%. Now, uh, the uh, interest rates got uh, uncapped last year, March of last year. And this came at the back of COVID, where all of us know that the NPAs just shot up, right? 11, 12% and, and substantial amount of write-offs. Uh, so a, an NBFC who's operating for profit will need to recover that money from somewhere, right? So that is also kind of getting added a bit. Possibly they're hoping that over the next five, ten years, they'll kind of slowly recover that. So sir, broadly, that's how it all adds up to uh, 23, 24%. Uh, one point I would like to mention here is that you take a home loan at 7%, you take a one crore, one and a half crore at 7, 8%, and you take a small ticket loan at whatever 20%, uh, you should not be comparing both, right? Because processing fee, uh, processing effort is broadly the same for both the loans. But when you calculate in terms of fractions, it will appear to be a large fraction for a small ticket loan. Similarly, the, the thing to look at, and I'll just take a, a couple of minutes more. The thing to look at is that why are the borrowers taking these loans at rates which supposedly are looked at as being higher than other loans. A, because this is far better than the other options that the borrower has. B, they look at cash flows, right? So if he's taken a loan of 50,000, he is looking at, he or she is looking at how much money I have to pay every week or every month. And if that 50,000 is invested in a business which is able to give cash flows which are higher, double or triple of what the EMI is, they're they're okay paying that, right? So those are the few other other things which one has to keep in mind when we are evaluating this kind of a problem. Well, thank you very much. So there is this additional cost that you have spelt out, which is a very high operational cost, uh, which is there. So adding to the idea of this universal financial services obligation fund that I talked about, so in lieu of the CSR, obligations, if the entire financial sector, say, were to give 2% of their profit to this fund, and then this fund can be parked with whoever cares to use it. It could be with MFIN, it could be with Sadhan, it could even be with BHTFC pension, saying that this is what we are doing with the micro pension, this is the additional cost, so can we need to, can we just simply draw this much money? That would really help. So that could be one source of funding. The second very important source of funding could be all these sectoral ministries uh, and state governments have their own finance development corporation. So you'll have this minorities finance development corporation, you'll have SCST finance development corporation, so on and so forth. And most of them really are not being able to make very meaningful interventions. And you know, one of the most uh, terrible performers in India has been the MSME sector and the most let's say, lack of aspiration uh, development financial institution is SIDB, uh, short of calling it a failure. So you'll find all these sectorial ministries pick up SIDB, which is a known failure, to park their sectoral funds. I mean, if SIDB was so good, MSMEs in India would have been so vibrant. The fact is that they're not. But that's the easy way out of passing the buck. So all this money goes to SIDB and it is parked there for developing, let's say, SCST entrepreneurs or uh, tribal entrepreneurs or minority entrepreneurs or women entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. Why can't this money be put in the Universal Financial Services Obligation Fund and let the private sector take care of it? They lend to exactly the same target audience that the domain ministry wishes to lend to and are simply given a subvention without complicating with the matters, without doing too much, as long as it's being done through regulated entities. So that was the uh, second thought. The third thought that came this morning, like uh, Dipaliji, you said, that bulk of our investments are in real estate. And just before this panel, we had this wonderful project, which has also been championed by Scotch to start with, 
is digitalization of land records. Can we dematerialize land records? Can we have clear land titles? Now, that project is well underway under Ministry of uh, uh, Rural Development and also Ministry of Panchayati Raj. And the kind of opportunities it creates of financial instruments based on real estate is not funny. I mean, you could, like gold traded funds, ETFs, you could have uh, exchange traded real estate. You could have people buying 1,000 rupees worth of real estate. People could be using that real estate as collateral. So both gold and real estate, which is 61%, why is it that gold is not a success story again on the exchange, on ETF? Again, the capacity issue. So while the product is available, people don't know about it. There is not enough capacity building. And secondly, as you said, gold is the second highest priority. The highest priority is real estate. So why don't we start there? So there is genuinely a dearth of products that are meant for the last mile. And one silver lining, of course, in financial deepening has been the non-life insurance uh, premium that have really significantly gone up. And we uh, have with us Mr. Amit uh, Jain, Chief Operating Officer of Aditya Birla Health Insurance. And I think in their sector, probably, they have some ideas on how to create more relevant products than, you know, pushing targets. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. So, sir, the way we look at in our sector is uh, there are three layers of uh, channels through which we or key interfaces through which we operate. So, one is the government, the second is the regulator and third is the manufacturers. So, fortunately for us in the last two years, uh, a lot of positive action has happened where our regulator has really very clearly put us a, uh, a very aspirational target, if I may use the word target, sir, that by 2047, uh, which is 100 years of our independence, uh, every citizen of India should have some form of insurance. It can be one risk coverage, it could be multiple risk coverages. Now the work is happening at three levels. What is the role of government? Now government so far has played two roles. One is as a funder, second is creating public health infrastructure. But given the scarcity of funds which government has, government broadly has decided now that they will not invest in public health infrastructure in a way which they have done so far. Rather, they will invest in two ways. One, as a funder, which is like schemes like Ayushman Bharat, uh, Pradhan Mantri Jivan Jyoti, Pradhan Mantri Fasal Yojana. That is where a lot of money is going and investments are going up so that they can reach out to a larger pool of people. And COVID was one, incident, one event which happened which has led to a clear awakening that government has to play that role of reaching to the below the poverty line and bigger masses. Second area where I think government has done an exceptional work is the digital public infrastructure. We all have, we all know eKYC, Aadhaar, uh, we are all speaking about now account aggregators, ONDC. I don't know how many of you have heard of ABA ID, which is a health ID equivalent to an Aadhaar. So this is a great infrastructure which the government is creating and investing, which is helping us to reach scale. Now digital requires investment upfront. It is expensive to begin with, but the scale which digital can give you, physical cannot give you. And the beauty of digital is given that we have more than now 100 crores mobile in the country, including smartphones and feature phones. You can sell any product to any consumer in any part of the country. The challenge is, do you have the right products, right? I, I must say that we as insurance industry are good at selling complex products. We haven't invested much in creating and selling simple products. And that is where regulator is coming in now. So regulator is focusing on three things. One is how do you create awareness? How do you create simple products? And how do you reach out to the last mile digitally? So there are three enabling regulations uh, which are on the anvil, which are Bhima Vahak, Bhima Vistar, and Bhima Sugam. I'll go one by one. Bhima Vahak is nothing but like a business correspondent in a bank, where they are saying even a eighth pass or a tenth pass can become an insurance agent, and they are preferring more women agents because what we have seen is experience of selling insurance in rural to women is much better than a male uh, uh, citizen mostly because a lot of women are earning and they take a lot of credit in uh, rural. So Bhima Vahak is how do you expand intermediation through a larger pool. Second is Bhima Vistar. So Bhima Vistar is a product which will be sold by Bhima Vahak 
and it's a product which will cover multiple risks. Now, right now, as Mr. Kocha rightly pointed out, you have to buy a separate life insurance product, a health insurance product, maybe a separate pension product, maybe a separate home insurance product, personal accident product. So the intent is, can I combine three or four risks in one product? So if a consumer is willing to pay for one product, he can buy one product and co get covered for multiple risks at one go. And the third is Bhima Sugam. Bhima Sugam, as we, envi as we are envisaging, it's a kind of a marketplace. It's like an Amazon or a UPI, you may say. And the idea is to create a marketplace where customers, intermediaries, and manufacturers come and compete in a very transparent way. Now, our sense is the way we are seeing the regulator is uh, moving. It's a matter of nine months to 15 months when a lot of these assets will be reality and larger pool of uh, consumers will start getting the benefit out of it. So I am very confident that with the way digital is changing the landscape, rural market, which has been a challenge for all of us to crack, we all, we all speak of how do you crack Bharat, and we all end up focusing a lot on the top, I will say 100, 150 markets in the country, which are becoming more and more competitive, not easy to make money, but nobody has been able to crack Bharat the way we want to crack it. But I am very optimistic and very confident the way at least insurance moving, we are going to crack it. And at times we don't look at it like a cost. If you ask me in the short term, it's an investment, right? Whether that investment will pay off or not, uh, it's a decision which many shareholders will take because at the end of the day, you are in a business. And if it's a large opportunity to tap into, you have to invest for the long run. And if you are investing, then I'm sure if you do right things at the right time, returns will come. But my hope comes from the right regulations, the right regulatory environment, and the support of the government in the right path to make it possible. I think last thing which I want to say is that in India, one of the challenges is that, uh, and I think uh, Madam Joshi also speak of, uh, speak of is awareness. Whether we like it or not, in India, financial literacy is still low. And that is why the skewness which we see in many of the financial products. So one area I think where we have to invest significantly is awareness. And there are two ways to invest. One is we re directly reach out to the consumers, which is something like what mutual fund industry may have done beautifully uh, through mutual funds are here, but still the opportunity is very large as a uh, lot of the panel, uh, panel may, my co-panelists spoke about. So awareness is one thing, how do we crack it? And digital again is a great way of creating awareness. But I feel awareness cannot only happen by reaching out to the consumers directly. Intermediates play a very important role. And I think we have underinvested somewhere on intermedi intermediaries to create awareness. Our relationship with intermediaries has been more transactional, more to get business. How do we invest in them so that they become our last mile to create a lot of awareness? Maybe a great way to change the landscape, the way we look at it. But we have to be patient. We are a country which is seeing rapid increase in our per capita GDP. There will be an inflection point after which we'll see an exponential increase. So maybe that inflection point is near, but we will definitely see the fruits of all the good work which has been done at all levels in the last 10 to 15, 20 years. That's how I look at it. So Dipaliji, you've been a central banker and a regulator, and the complicated or complex products of the sort that Amit Jain is talking about uh, would involve multiple regulators. I mean, you know, the kind of product he's talking about, so you'd have SEBI, you would have PFRDA, you would certainly have uh, RBI, you would have IRDAI, all of them involved in this product. So do we need a regulatory reform before we can even think of such a product? Are we moving towards a unified financial regulation? Is that desirable? Otherwise, how do you enable all these silos? No, I mean, there is a move towards that. There is an integrated ombudsman scheme, as you know. And you know that the FSDC came about because there were all these conflicts which happened, and the RBI also became not primus inter pairs, but one of the pairs. So it was not willing. I mean, there was a problem on that. So I don't know. This, this would involve multiple regulators only if there was a problem, and you needed uh, you needed to get your claim back. But otherwise, there, would, there was one central regulator administering the product. I don't see a problem. The yeah. problem will arise if something goes wrong. And then you, you don't know who to go to. Yeah, I mean, I 
tend to agree with you because if you look at this entire Jandhan Yojana and financial inclusion, actually succeeded because there was Department of Financial Services almost like a single point mission chasing it. Uh, we need maybe probably more of that for. It wouldn't have worked if it hadn't been the RBI. Sorry, my, if it hadn't been the RBI, the banks would not have listened. And the banks listen to the RBI because it has the power to impose penalty. Otherwise, uh, they would not listen. They would no. not have listened just to the DFS. So. No, actually, in this case, I found RBI, RBI, was, RBI was creating uh, more stumbling blocks than solving them in the include the. In you know, oh. <laughs> initial BC policy, they said BCs yeah. have Maybe to be not to. for, the biggest one being BCs have to be not for profit. Only uh, retired postmasters and yeah, school teachers true. can be BCs. You know, so it's as socialist as it you know, gets. The whole, Corporate BCs it. were not involved, uh, not allowed. So, you know, it yeah. took single-handedly Scots Guru writing okay, three I books and so many battles to get this straightened out. And we did use Ministry of Finance pressure on RBI. I recall sitting across Madam Usha Thorat and having very long conversations with her. And she's a very strong lady of very strong opinions. And you know, getting her to uh, yield an inch was very difficult. But anyway, we, we managed. So I know the kind of battles that lie ahead. So the battles which we had with the ministry was simply that, you know, you get 2% for grounding a project. Why do you not share it? Because if you share it, then the BCs do not necessarily have to be pre-funded. I mean, as in the argument was that if there's a bank teller, I can't tell him that I'm just going to give you 5,000 rupees. And if Mr. Jen comes and asks for 5,500, you tell him to come tomorrow. So that, that was the argument. And they, the Ministry of Rural Development has a lot of funds up its sleeve, which it was reluctant to share. And had that happened, it would have been very easy. See, even now, you're, you see, there are, there's a lot of turf involved in all these ministries. So I doubt very much if they would be willing to give up those loaves and fishes so very easily to create a centralized pool. And if there was a centralized pool, would it also be as bureaucratized as the MD, MFDEF, and other funds with the NABAD and other agencies? And with SIDBI, I, I am inclined to agree with you on SIDBI, but. Well, there it is. But you know, one interesting uh, area of study which I was discussing with Sadhan and of course now uh, with MFIN and others, of, uh, if they can possibly chip in. So are there any cost intervention funds that are already lying somewhere? Like in interest subvention, there's a lot of money lying with SIDBI. A yeah. uh, lot of money lying with uh, yeah. state government for promoting yeah, MSMEs. Yeah. Lot of, yeah, yeah. So, but so then why is this and money just is, lying? Really why is no, no one using it? And what, what needs to change for us to be able to effectively use it? Because... Any thoughts? Yeah, so... Uh, so, yeah, so to the points which I made okay, earlier... Perhaps... Uh, yeah. Madam is speaking. Yeah, we'll... Uh, control room, can you just mute the internet? Yeah, so to the issues that which, which I had uh, uh, talked about earlier, what do we do about them, right? So we have high cost of funds, we have high operational cost, etc. What do we do about them? So of course the easy solution is to make low cost funds available to the lenders, wholesale funds to these lenders. How do you do that? So for example, SIDBI has a scheme to refinance these lenders. NABARD also has a scheme to refinance. So some part of that money does flow to us. Uh, it could be more, of course, and we are we constantly engage with both SIDBI and NABAD to kind of get these things rolling. Other is to, uh, for these companies to go to the market, raise equity or debt, whatever, at cheaper rates. For smaller firms, that's a problem. So SIDBI has a, a scheme called India Microfinance Equity Fund, where they do put money in, in companies which they feel are having good governance practices, etc. A small amount of money in equity from SIDBI goes a long way in putting a stamp of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a stamp of uh, kind of uh, co confidence in those particular companies, which they can then go to the market and do it. Uh, let me now come to the operational side. What do we do? How do we reduce those costs? Of course, uh, one leg is when you give money, other leg is when you collect money, right? Giving money, that leg has been 
fully made online, right? So everything happens in the field. Uh, all the technologies, India stack, Aadhaar, authentication, Jandan accounts, direct money transfer to the account, all that happens. It's the other leg, which is when you get the money back. There, we have to have a physical interface because a lot of money earned by these borrowers is in terms of cash. So you can't really expect them to repay it. Uh, uh, you know, they have to repay it in cash. And at the same time, there is a issue of behavioral change which is required, which takes time. So you can't really force things on them. So, but a lot of action on that front is happening. Costs are coming down, but, but as Mr. Kocha mentioned and other speakers also, a whole lot of other stuff which needs to be done, larger quantums possibly, uh, you know, to really bring the cost down. Any uh, last comments from you? So on the, I just want to, you know, two comments on the, on this whole challenge of financial literacy, right? And financial literacy uh, is a problem that is quite gargantuan. It is a large problem. We know the, you know, the, the most recent RBI survey from what I recollect, still spoke about less than 25% of Indians being financially aware. So there is a huge problem there. And I yes. think if we are able to fundamentally address it, I mean, it's a, it's a joke that this is a life skill, right? Managing money is a life skill. And uh, this has to start from the schools. I believe there are some initiatives that have been taken, you know, in the CBSE board and it's, it's being integrated in the curriculum. But I think it needs to be done at, at a very different pace. It has to be integrated. It is as important as science and commerce. So I think we have to address this issue of, uh, you know, of financial literacy. We have to address it at the roots. It might take us 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But I think we will get significantly better in the future if we are able to address it. That's point number one. Point number two, and that's related to the, uh, to the point about product. I think simplicity of products is something that is very critical. Why is it that UPI has succeeded, right? Why is it that there are 75 crore Indians who are on UPI? Why is it that, that in, a, in a month like October, 11 billion transactions happened on UPI up to 18, 18 lakh crores? So I think it's the simplicity. I think we underestimate the ability of the person at the lowest level to understand things. If you're able to simplify it sufficiently, I think they will understand. Of course, I'm not trying to trivialize this by saying that, you know, simplify a financial product. Financial products, you know, it inherently has some complexity. But I think there are ways to storify it and communicate it to the individual such that they're able to quickly grasp it and they're able to adapt it as a part of their, I think that's, that's, these are the two comments that I wanted to make on financial literacy and simplification. Yeah, so just to add, I think one of the important things which is happening uh, is how, how do you segment the market and reach out to the customer with the right product. So if you see credit is one area where uh, our credit penetration is increasing every day and that is bringing another set of challenges. But what we have seen is very simple products, if they are attached to a credit product because insurance is at the end of the day, it's a risk management product. And a lot of lenders come to us for managing the risk to buy insurance and then sell it to the uh, customer eventually. So what we have seen is if you identify the right product, convert it into a bite product and price it correctly, the offtake really improves if the main product manufacturer like a lender here and an insurer works together well. And if you are able to fulfill it digitally, nothing like it because while there is an upfront investment, ultimately the cost goes down. Similarly, a classic example is IRCTC. If you would have heard of, they are the biggest digital company, so to say, and they have the maximum data in the country. And they are tied up with a general insurance company where they attach a personal accident product with every ticket they sell. And it's not a mandatory attachment. It's a, uh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's by choice. Now, some of these are great products to sell if you are able to uh, fulfill it well at the right cost. And I think Shidam also pointed, I also pointed, awareness is very important. As awareness will increase, people will buy these products. Uh, so I think we are in the right direction from that perspective. Uh, but important is to create the right products, make it as small as you can, and make it as short as you can. That is what many consumers appreciate, so that they end, they end up not paying more. Well, that in a sense is the UPI story, but two of the aspects of UPI that often don't uh, get talked about at all, uh, as part of one is it's free, and the two is that there is MPCI as a regulator has made sure that there is intense competition and there is a market cap, uh, market share cap that is there. So while market share cap is good, 
I don't know, UPI being free, how long can this be sustained unless they also dig into the same universal services, financial services obligation fund that I talked about. I think it is coming across almost like a solution to many, many ills. With that, I thank this panel and we'll come together for a picture and then we move on to the next session. Thank you very much.